Did you know that hospital acquired complications can make a significant impact both in the clinical performance of a health network or hospital and on the funding? Let's talk about that and more in this episode of Coding Matters Hospital Acquired Complications. Hey, it's Andrew here, and today we'll be talking about hospital-acquired complications. It's a really important issue, and one that we've kind of alluded to or touched on occasionally uh, in previous uh, episodes of Coding Matters. It's important to know that hospital-acquired complications, on the whole, are preventable, but just because they occur and may not reflect very well on our overall clinical performance, they still can actually increase our overall funding uh, for episodes of care. So it's not something to be kind of uh, brushed under the rug. We need to be uh, honest and open about our hospital acquired complications and continually work to reduce and uh, prevent the ones that are completely preventable. So today we're gonna to look at the types of hospital acquired complications that exist, the effect on hacks on our clinical performance and funding, and there's a number of examples that we'll look at. And finally, we'll conclude about the difference that clinical documentation can make to those hacks. So hospital acquired complications are a well-studied group of disorders. The Australian Commission on Safety and Quality have a specific definition and it's written there. A hospital acquired complication refers to a complication for which clinical risk mitigation strategies may reduce, and that's important, not all of these are preventable. They may reduce, but not necessarily eliminate the risk that complication of that complication occurring. So there are 16 hacks. Uh, let's have a look at them now. Uh, you can see a lot of these are very familiar and when I teach about hospital acquired complications and about preventable infections I particularly think about urinary tract infections that are related to uh, indwelling catheters. I think about hospital acquired pneumonia, many of which are preventable, some of which are not. Uh, and I also think about other um, surgical and procedural based um, infections uh, related to sterile technique and appropriate uh, care of those wounds. Um, I think pressure injuries as being the one is a very important one that um, although nurses I think lead the way in there that, that as doctors we have a really important role to be playing and the documentation of that is really important for the coding. Let's have a look in a bit more detail about some of these. You can see here uh, different stages of ulcers within the pressure uh, injury category or falls and we've talked before about falls. Check out our Coding Matters geriatrics um, focus if you want to see more on how to document uh, falls and the complications and the uh, conditions that contribute to those falls in order to get the most accurate coding and funding. Um, surgical complications clearly feature heavily here as well as healthcare associated infections um, and venous thromboembolism. You can see here as well, renal failure, a lot of different organs that can be involved, complications related to medications, many of which should be preventable, some of which are just known side effects that may occur. Um, so the, the pricing can make a big difference uh, and the safety and quality performance also makes a big difference and we've put some, some particular quotes there from our coding team. Um, as we talked before, clinical coding influences clinical audit, it also influences activity-based funding and it influences clinical performance. In this case, not so much about the auditing, but it is about the funding and the clinical performance. Um, this is where they kind of factor into our um, formulation. So if this is your first time watching a Coding Matters video, um, this is how coding occurs. We have a principal diagnosis that relates to a disease related group or DRG. There's over 400 of those, but they're basically a category for a reason or diagnosis that someone attends a hospital as an inpatient. And then complexity is added to that episode according to the secondary diagnoses, the complications, comorbidities, and any procedures that are done either therapeutically or diagnostically. In terms of hospital acquired complications, these are really gonna affect the secondary diagnoses and the complications of that particular event. And again, just a reminder for those that haven't seen Coding Matters before, every time that we have a condition, it needs to meet a certain criteria. So it has a diagnostic statement. That's often where we fall down because we're using uh, clinical impressions or terminology about symptoms and signs rather than diagnostic terminology in our documentation. There needs to be some kind of a diagnostic or therapeutic intervention that's undertaken and a plan about how we're going to deal with that issue. So here's some examples. Uh, category nine is gastrointestinal bleeding. Um, hack uh, will increase the complexity and the associated funding even though you will take a penalty. So the hack penalty is roughly 10% uh, of the total uh, funding. Uh, but sometimes when you're actually increasing the funding by double, taking a 10% penalty actually overall is beneficial. 
Uh, and that's just one example of how being very accurate with our documentation, regardless of whether it's a hack or not, is really important. So this patient was admitted for five days and has a number of comorbidities you can see listed there. They had Molina during the admission, but didn't really have any care plan. So then it's only qualified for minor complexity. However, if we had dehydration and we investigated this Molina during the admission, and it was then classified as a hack, you can see that that increases the complexity up to major. It's more than double the amount of funding, um, even after there's been a penalty for that hack. So it's very worthwhile doing, um, because obviously that patient received a lot of extra care, and we're doc not documenting, we're effectively being underpaid for that episode of care. Here's another cardiac complication in category 14. A uh, patient admitted for seven days with acute cholecystitis and a calculus in the gallbladder, a couple of complications, and then had an MI. If it's just documented as just an, an MI, that seems to, you know, might be related to a hospital acquired complication, and you can see that the complexity is the same, but we suffer that penalty. If we were actually to relate it to the condition, and we say that this is a type two MI arising from that condition, it's not a hospital quiet complication anymore. It's a complication of the reason that they presented to hospital. So you can see just that very small influence of the documentation being more accurate changes the way this is classified. And suddenly we don't get penalized for having that classified as a hack. So our funding is better, and also our clinical performance is better because it's not a hack. Hashtag not a hack. Uh, the, you can see here in terms of this patient, they're admitted for five days, similar kind of issues, investigated Molina um, during admission. If we were actually gonna relate that to an existing condition, so diverticular disease, we're effectively saying that this person, because of the condition they have, are at constant risk of having this complication, Molina related to diverticular disease. And therefore, if they present with that out of the hospital or they present with it happen to be within a hospital admission, it won't actually be classified as a hospital acquired complication. We're recognizing this person's at chronic risk of that event occurring. It just happens to have occurred in the hospital. You can see again, the complexity doesn't change, but we don't get penalized and we will have better performance statistics. So you can see here that the documentation around the, the relation of that particular potential hack and its uh, relation in terms of timing, whether it was identified or suspected on admission, or if it's related to underlying comorbidities is really, really important. Um, I've constructed this little diagram that talks about the four kind of categories that you might um, have an event and how it may or may not be classified as a hack. In this particular diagram, only the red one is actually a hack, and there's three other variants. Have a look at them now. If we kind of track an event that happens related to the admission, we go, this is present and diagnosed on admission. That may actually be the primary diagnosis or the principal diagnosis for which the person has presented to the hospital. That's not a hack. If we suspected that it was on, uh, on admission, but we didn't actually diagnose it until partway through the admission, that is also not a hack, that's okay. We just needed more time to clarify that. That may be a secondary diagnosis related to their principal reason for attending. If there's just an independent event that occurred during that hospital admission, it's not related to underlying comorbidity, it's not related specifically to their principal diagnosis, that is a hack and we need to be clear about that. If this has occurred during the admission, a bit like that last example we talked about with diverticular disease causing an episode of Molina during the admission, unrelated to the reason they presented to hospital, that, because it's related to a pre-existing condition, is also not a hack. And that's one where we probably need to improve documentation the most, because those are probably falling into that category of hack most often when actually they are not hacks. Love to see improvements in your documentation in this area and help prevent that mistake from occurring. So to summarize what we've talked about with hospital acquired complications, we've talked about the idea that there are 16 different categories that have been defined uh, within the Australian system. And many of these are preventable, although not all of them are, but we can work to do that. We've looked at the impact of hacks, uh, hacks on funding and on clinical performance. And ideally, we want to be performing the best we can. And so documenting when things are hacks or when they're not is really, really important for that purpose. We've seen how hacks can influence funding for better and also for worse. We talked about that idea of that roughly 10% penalty, um, which is appropriate if it is actually a hack. If it's not a hack, we can document that more clearly and miss out on that 10% penalty. But sometimes those events are adding overall to the complexity and increasing it maybe from minor to intermediate or from intermediate to major, uh, as some examples we looked at there. So don't always think that having a hack is, is a bad thing for funding. Sometimes it's actually really beneficial and will help the hospital cover the real cost of those complications in that patient's admission.
Uh, lastly, we looked at how important clinical documentation is and how we document things matters a lot to the categorization of those events as being a hack or not a hack, depending on whether they are related to the reason they are admitted, whether it was suspected but not yet confirmed until later in the admission, versus uh, events that have occurred during the admission but not actually related specifically to them being a hospital related to underlying conditions. That's the area that we can improve the most. So thanks for watching and I hope that this has helped inform improvements to your clinical documentation and therefore your hospital's performance and funding related to hospital acquired complications.